Welcome to Durban and the first ever Cambridge Nedbank Coppuccino, our daily dip into the dazzling world of Durban's Cop. We're delighted and it's entirely appropriate that our first guest should be Cristiano Figueres, the Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC. Well, thank you, Richard. I didn't know I was the first ever, but that's quite no, an you're, honor, you're, so you're thank making, you. You're making history. Thank and, you. Uh, this is a, a, a visual event that is going to go out around the world, as you know. Wonderful. Many of the people watching um, have a sense that the COP, the, the COP event is merely a complex uh, negotiation between highly politicized parties. But there's much more going on, isn't there? Can you explain the full COP? Yes, the full COP. Um, it has actually grown uh, in its scope. I would say I've been with the COP now for 17 years. Uh, and I must say, as I remember back to the first COPs that we had, it was very much only an intergovernmental process. Very interestingly, even the delegations have grown uh, in their composition. And we now have members of very different sectors in the government delegation. Today, I met uh, five youngsters from India who are officially members of the India delegation, are running around with their little pink badges. Uh, but they are teenagers who have been brought on by the Indian government to appreciate what is going on here in the broadest sense. The, the hub, it's a great word the for hub. it. In Greek times, classical times, it might have been called the agora, yes. the marketplace of ideas, networking, and so on. How does that relate to the negotiation process? Is there an opportunity for the one to influence the other? as seeing a very valuable opportunity to put out new ideas. Facing climate, addressing climate successfully has never been done before and needs a lot of innovative thinking. A lot of the innovative thinking doesn't come from the governments themselves. It comes from this broader platform, this hub, this agora of people who are accompanying this process academics, thinkers, civil society, who are thinking alongside governments what solutions could be put on the table. They test the ideas with each other. And many of the, these ideas then get filtered up over time. I'm not saying that immediately, mm. but over time they get filtered up. And eventually they get taken up in the process. Period. What makes a good negotiator? It's not just a good negotiator for your country. It's a good negotiator for the planet. I suppose the question is, are we moving fast enough? Of course. Now, you come from a revolutionary family. Your father was I a do. revolutionary leader uh, some while ago. Um, doesn't it require a revolution? Yes. And I have said, actually, that this is probably the largest, the most deeply rooted revolution that mankind has ever seen. And that's why it's slow. Yes, the pace of negotiations are slow. And it's certainly slow compared to what science tells us that we're supposed to be doing. The reality, though, however, is that what we're looking at is such a deep transformation that it will revolutionize the way you and I interact with each other, the way we travel, the way we consume, the way we produce, everything. There is not one aspect of our human life that will not be touched by this. Those who will profit, and I hope you and I are still alive to see a complete transformation, yeah. but our lives will be very, very, very different. So we are talking here about a very serious revolution. Yeah and one that we're very welcome to see. Back to the COP. Back How to the COP. Can the COP engender that sort of revolution? Because there will be cynics around who would say it stands in the way, because the political impasse that tends to be reached at times uh, can't serve that uh, agenda that is revolutionary. Well, you see, but the revolution can't happen without international, intergovernmental agreement. It is part and parcel. You have to have international policy that sets the direction. You have to have national level policy that brings that direction down into the countries. And then you have to have implementation on the part particularly of the private sector and of civil society. I've always been of the opinion that the policy, the governments at the international level and at the national level are basically the ones sitting at the steering wheel telling us what road we're walking down. But the motor? The motor is the private sector and civil society. And both of them have to work in consonance with each other. You can't do it without. What is success for Durban? Success for Durban is actually pretty simple to define. And I would define it in two packages. The first package has to do with all of the institutional arrangements that were agreed to in theory, mm. on paper, in Cancun but that actually need to be brought to life. The other package that is much more of a political nature and definitely the more challenging part of Durban 
is what do you do with the emerging mitigation framework? So countries are very, very clear that there is the challenge of the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. How do you take forward the reduction of emissions of industrialized countries on one hand? Mm. And also, how do you sum to that effort? How do you complement it with comparable efforts on the part of those industrialized countries that are not in the Kyoto Protocol and of emerging countries that will very soon be in a position due to their respective capabilities to also begin to contribute some solutions. Well, thank you for joining us and taking time out. We appreciate it very much. Mr. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very you much. Richard. Indeed.